Hi, and welcome to the presentation on tips 40 and 43, medication-assisted treatment for opioid addiction in opi opioid treatment programs, brought to you by allceus.com. Let's talk a little bit about methadone maintenance. Methadone does not produce the euphoric, tranquilizing, or an analgesic effects like morphine or heroin, so it's less concerning to be a substance of abuse. It doesn't mean it's not a substance of abuse. Um, there are people who do take it in excess, um, but it is a lot harder to abuse and it does help people who are trying to come off of the more detrimental drugs like morphine and heroin. Therapeutic doses of methadone reduce or block euphoric and tranquilizing effects of all opioid drugs. So when it's at a therapeutic level, if somebody takes morphine or heroin, they don't get the high off of it. They don't get the effects that they're expecting. Over time, usually no changes are noted in tolerance to levels of methadone. So people can be maintained, note methadone maintenance therapy, maintained on certain levels of methadone indefinitely. It is effective when administered orally, so you don't need to have people using needles to inject methadone, um, which needles tend to be a trigger for a lot of our opiate abusers. Methadone can relieve opioid cravings. When it starts blocking the receptors, the cravings for the opioids do go down, and it tends to cause minimal side effects. Um, one of the things that we would see in our uh, pregnant and postpartum women, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in this presentation. Um, when they were on therapeutic levels of methadone, they tended to be a little bit drowsy. So it was harder for them, especially when they had a newborn, to effectively parent without a little bit of coaching. So a lot of our mothers, um, once they had the baby, would start to detox off of the methadone so that they didn't feel so groggy on top of the sleep deprivation caused by the infant. That is something that your program has to decide and the patient has to decide in conjunction with her physician. If it's likely that she will relapse without the use or continuance of methadone, then it's probably better for her to stay on methadone than to detox. California's drug and alcohol treatment assessment findings indicated treatment was cost beneficial averaging seven dollars return for every dollar invested on methadone treatment. Methadone treatment yields savings of three dollars to four dollars for every dollar spent. Patients in methadone treatment showed the greatest reduction in intensity of heroin use decreased utilization of healthcare services like the emergency room, medical doctors, decreases in some of the um, transmitted diseases. And the number of days of hospitalization was down more than half when they were on methadone treatment. So let's talk a little bit about pharmacology. Receptors are the first thing that we're going to talk a lot about and we're going to talk about opioid receptors. We're going to talk about the function of opioids at the receptors. The consequences of repeated administration and withdrawal of opioids. The affinity, intrinsic activity and dissociation of opioids from receptors. And general characteristics of opioids of abuse. Okay, so receptors. There are different types of receptors in the brain. There are receptors for your serotonin. There are receptors for GABA. There are receptors for a variety of neurotransmitters. The mu receptor is most relevant to opioid treatment. Activation of this receptor allows opioids to exert their analgesic, euphorogenic, and addictive effects. So when the drug gets in there and hits this receptor and kind of wakes it up, then the person goes, oh, that feels good. Um, so the activation of this receptor is what we want to sort of keep from happening. We need to block that receptor so it can't wake up and produce those effects. Full agonists bind to the receptors, activate the receptors in the brain, and bind to receptors and turn them. 
Increasing doses of full agonists produces increasing effects until the receptor is fully activated. So basically, we're stimulating it to the point where if they take heroin, they don't even notice it. But it's not stimulating it in a way that is stimulating for the person. It's not um, creating that euphorogenic effect. Opioids with the greatest abuse potential are full agonists. So heroin, for example, it gets to that receptor, it stimulates it totally, completely. It's like full on. Yeah, that's going to be something you're going to remember. Examples of full agonists include morphine, heroin, methadone, notice methadone's in there, oxycodone, and hydromorphone. Antagonists bind to opioid receptors, but instead of activating them, they block them. So they sort of put up a wall and they say, you can't get in here and activate these receptors. They prevent receptors from being activated by agonist compounds. So the heroin gets there and there's nowhere for it to go. It's like a sponge that has completely absorbed everything. You can't get it to suck up any more fluid. Like a key that fits in a lock but does not open it and prevents another key from being inserted. So the um, antagonists bind to the lock. It's kind of like putting super glue. Have you ever put super glue in a lock? <laughs> yeah, it fits in the lock. It molds and does all kinds of nice things, but it, super glue doesn't open the lock and then you can't get the key in anymore. Examples of opioid antagonists include naltrexone and naloxone. So these are things that you can put that basically super glue that receptor shut. Partial, partial agonists possess some of the properties of both antagonists and full agonists. They bind to receptors and activate them, but not to the same degree as full agonists. Increasing effects of partial agonists reach maximum levels and don't increase further. This is called a ceiling effect. So at a certain point, no matter how much more you take, it doesn't make you feel any better, any less good, any less pain, any anything. You reach that ceiling and nothing. As higher doses are reached, partial agonists can act like antagonists by occupying the receptors, but not from activating them and blocking full agonists from receptors. Buprenorphine is an example of a mu opioid partial agonist. Consequences of repeated administration and withdrawal. Repeated administration of an opioid agonist results in tolerance and dose-dependent physical dependence. So if you keep providing this opioid agonist, the brain is going to get used to it being there, which creates tolerance. So when you take it away, there are withdrawal effects. It also results in dose-dependent physical dependence. So you're reliant on that dose in order to not have withdrawal symptoms. Withdrawal symptoms are similar to the flu. Spontaneous withdrawal begins 6 to 12 hours after the last dose, peaks in intensity at 36 to 72 days, so it starts within 6 hours and lasts like 4 days before it even peaks, and lasts approximately 5 days. So this person can expect if they have a significant withdrawal to not feel very good for about five days. When we had clients who would start decreasing their dose because they decided that they didn't want to be on methadone anymore or they thought that they had gotten to the point in their recovery from all their other substances that they were ready to detox from the methadone as well, they would gradually step down. But even at the gradual step down, most of them had some mild flu-like symptoms um, for three to five days. And it was the same sort of thing that we're talking about here, just not to the same intensity. Um, if people step down too quickly, then they do get pretty daggum sick. Um, we had a couple of patients who were in residential who decided that they were ready to be off of it. And the doctor um, stepped them down 
as rapidly as he felt was safe for that person. So they were taking some pretty significant jumps. And every time they stepped down an, another level, they were sick for three to five days. They got over it. But it also reminded them that they didn't want to go through that again. So it was also a good reminder about what detox from their drugs of abuse were like. So you can look at the positives or the negatives. Precipitated withdrawal occurs when an individual physically dependent on opioids is administered an opioid antagonist or partial agonist. So if your body's used to having this opioid in there, such as heroin, and you're given an antagonist, the superglue, and not given any heroin, and even if you are, it doesn't get to the receptors, you start into a withdrawal. And the withdrawal it takes place over this period of time where it can be very unpleasant. So it's important to warn patients, if you're putting them on an antagonist as a first stage in treatment, to warn them that you are going to feel pretty bad for the first week. If they don't, great. I haven't seen a case where that's happened, but I guess it's possible. Affinity is the strength with which a drug binds to its receptor. It's how strong they hold on to each other. Intrinsic activity is the degree to which a drug activates its receptors. So let's think about pepper. This is an easy one because everybody's tasted pepper. The intrinsic activity, the intrinsic thermogenic activity of black pepper is much less than the intrinsic thermogenic activity of cayenne pepper. Black pepper you can get on your tongue and it's spicy, but it usually doesn't bring tears to your eyes. Cayenne pepper can bring tears to your eyes. We're talking about the same thing with different drugs. Some drugs will have a lower intrinsic activity. Dissociation is the measure of disengagement of the drug from the receptor. So how much does it disengage? How much does it separate from the receptor? Or does it hang on there pretty well? Characteristics of abused drugs. The rate of onset of the pharmacological effects of a drug and its abuse potential is determined by so how fast the drug actually hits somebody and makes them start feeling high or start feeling better or whatever word you want to use, it's determined by the drug's route of administration. Is it injected? Is it inhaled? Is it taken orally? Is it absorbed through the skin? Is it time release? Obviously, the more directly the drug gets into the bloodstream, the faster it's going to get into the brain and do what it needs to do. So taking it orally, it has to go through the stomach and be digested and all kinds of other stuff. The drug's half-life. If it has a short half-life, it's gonna go in, bang, do its job, and be out. If it's like caffeine, something that has a long half-life, then you take it and it generally is a more gradual in and out. So instead of having a peak and a drop, It's lipophilicity, which determines how fast the drug reaches the brain. How fast does it grab on to the fatty acids and get through the blood-brain barrier? Abuse potential is related to the ease of administration. How easy is it to get this drug and take it? If you, can you snort it? Do you have to go through all these steps in preparation? The longer it takes to administer, the more challenging it is to administer. Theoretically, the less abuse potential it has. The cost of the drug. Wild turkey is probably abused a whole lot more than black label Johnny Walker. Or whatever it is, black label. So, the cost of the drug affects how likely it is to be abused and how fast the user experiences the desired results. Xanax, and I know Xanax is not an opioid, but it's a perfect example of how fast the user experiences the desired results. People take Xanax, it gets into their bloodstream, it's got a very short half-life, 
and it does its job and release, relieves the anxiety very quickly. Um, things like Boost Bar take longer to get into the bloodstream and Zoloft take longer to get into the bloodstream and they don't produce that oh yeah I feel a lot better now you don't have that bing it's more of a gradual over days the same thing for um, opioids and pain medications and all of these drugs that we're talking about here if the user experiences the rush quickly then it's going to be more likely to be abused because then they on a more primitive level associate the drug with the feeling of euphoria it's like ooh, I take that and I feel a lot better this is a good thing now Trexone is an antagonist it also may decrease the likelihood of relapse to drinking one thing that I want you to remember when people are on um, methadone or other opioid treatments is that they can drink a whole lot of alcohol before they feel the effects oftentimes and they can actually get alcohol poisoning without even realizing it um, so if you have somebody who's taking methadone and they show up staggering drunk you know that there's a good chance it's a medical crisis so you need to get that person evaluated to see what their blood alcohol level is this isn't always the case, it's not the case with every drug, but it is sort of a good rule to remember. Now, Trexone can precipitate an opioid withdrawal syndrome in buprenorphine maintained patients. Since, oh, now, Trexone is an antagonist, it puts up the wall, it blocks the feelings. If the person is on buprenorphine, then they're used to having a little bit of the stimulation of those receptors so it can precipitate a withdrawal sy syndrome. Now Trexone should not be prescribed for patients being treated with buprenorphine for opioid addiction because it can precipitate an opio opioid withdrawal syndrome. Generally when people start to have a withdrawal sy syndrome unless they're in a medically monitored detox their chances of relapse are extremely huge. They're just like, oh no, <laughs> I'm not doing this. It also can be dangerous for certain patients. So just be aware of all these things. And your um, supervising attending physician is well aware of all these. But if clients want to know the differences between all the medications, this is one thing that you can tell them why you wouldn't want to go from buprenorphine to naltrexone. So let's talk about buprenorphine. Typical analgesic dose is 0.3 to 0.6 milligrams, which lasts about six hours. Because it's a partial agonist, remember on the last slide we talked about how it partially or stimulates the, the receptors a little bit. Because it's a partial agonist, higher doses have fewer adverse effects. It's high affinity, which means it really likes to grab onto those receptors and stick there. Present, prevents displacement and it has a slow dissociation or half-life. The dissociation, remember, is how, how quickly it backs off. Daily dosing is not necessarily required. Abuse of buprenorphine, primarily through diverting sublingual tablets to the injection route, is what you've got to watch out for. If you use a lot of buprenorphine in your clinic, and suddenly you start seeing needle marks, important to be aware of. Um, you're probably monitoring the dosage so you're not going to have medication coming up missing, but it is important if you're not getting the effects you want um, to look for track marks to test to see what the um, blood concentration is of the buprenorphine. Buprenorphine has a lower abuse or overdose potential than full agonists due to its sealing effect. Remember, the full agonists fully stimulate those receptors. Buprenorphine only partially stimulates those, and once you get to a certain level, like kind of, sort of, awake, no matter how much more you take, those receptors don't wake up anymore. So you reach the ceiling, and then it's like, what's the point? 
Buprenorphine can precipitate an opioid withdrawal syndrome in somebody who's been on a full agonist or who has been using um, heroin or one of those other full agonists. It should not be con combined with opioid antagonists such as naltrexone because if you combine them then you've got a partial agonist combining with an antagonist so this guy's blocking this one and what's the point of the buprenorphine if naltrexone is blocking everything. Other medications that interact with the enzymes that are metabolized by buprenorphine should be used with caution. It's important to watch plasma concentrations of these drugs when they're administered with any of the newer antidepressants. Um, your, your Zoloft and Paxil and uh, Prozac, those are sort of your older antidepressants. You still want to keep an eye on them, but your newer ones like Wellbutrin definitely want to watch the plasma concentrations. Buprenorphine's partial mu agonist properties make it mildly reinforcing, thus encouraging the patient compliance with regular administration. It makes them feel a little bit better, but it's not woohoo! It's, oh, okay. Um, and, and there's a big difference. You want to make sure that your patients are realizing that life without opioids doesn't suck. So if they are completely miserable and in pain and all these other things all the time, you're probably not going to have good compliance. Buprenorphine naloxone combinations were developed for the US market to decrease the potential for abuse. When taken as directed, it produces the buprenorphine effect. When dissolved and injected, it produces the naloxone or antagonist effect. So it's sort of a backstop to prevent it from being subverted from the sublingual to the injection. Comprehensive care and methadone treatment. Effective treatment is not just providing methadone and saying, okay, take your dose, see you later. You need to address mental health issues. Are they depressed? Are they anxious? What was the reason they were using? Do they have chronic pain? What's going on? Address their substance abuse issues. Are they also drinking, using cocaine? What other drugs are they abusing? What other behaviors are they addicted to? Are they compulsive gamblers? Do they have an eating disorder? Are they sex addicts? These are all things we need to look at because we don't want someone to substitute an addiction when they're on methadone maintenance. That's not helping them. That's just forcing them to look elsewhere to get their high. Help them address employment and finances. A lot of people have been working while they've been abusing substances, but a lot of people haven't. So help them find employment. Help them find employment that is willing to or able to allow them to continue to take their methadone for as long as the doctor and the patient determine necessary. Some jobs you can't use methadone. That is going to rule them out of some positions. So they may have to find another career if they're in one of those career paths that uh, you, it's too dangerous for them to be on methadone and operating heavy machinery or carrying a gun, things like that. Housing. Back to that good old Maslow's hierarchy. You should get used to me making this triangle. Housing, food, medical care. If they don't have the basics, they don't give a rat's patootie about working on their self-esteem or their communication skills. If they're hungry, tired, and in pain, you've got somebody who's pretty cranky and in crisis. So let's help them get the basic needs met first, which will help improve their mood. Because you know what? <laughs> if they've got a full belly and they're not in pain and they're well rested, life doesn't seem nearly as overwhelming. Social skills and support. A lot of our clients may need assistance with finding so developing their social skills and finding sober social support systems. Relationship skills. Parenting skills. Making these classes available 
is excellent. Making them a mandatory part of the treatment program in order to continue receiving dosing is excellent. Some states actually require that people complete a certain number of hours of psychoeducation and group therapy if they're going to be on methadone. Good treatment candidates are interested in treatment for addiction, have no contraindications, duh, can be expected to be reasonably compliant with treatment, understand the benefits and the risks, and are willing to follow safety precautions. If you've got somebody who starts treatment and wants you to start making exceptions for them from the get-go, probably not a good candidate. If you've got somebody who's got a lot of contraindications, may not be a good candidate. These are all things you need to review in treatment team. Poor treatment candidates have comor comorbid dependence on high doses of benzos or other central nervous system depressants including alcohol. So, poor treatment candidates include those who are dependent on depressants including alcohol, huffing paint, or benzos. Very, very deadly combinations. If they have significant untreated psychiatric comorbidity, and that can be bipolar, schizophrenia, depression. I've seen people with all of those diagnoses, not all of them at once, thank goodness for that person, but I've seen people with different diagnoses that were well controlled do well on methadone maintenance therapy. It doesn't mean that they can't be on it, but it has to be treated and controlled. Active or chronic suicidal or homicidal ideation or attempts. This is especially true when people start getting to the point of take home dosing where they can overdose. But it's important to remember regardless because if they take their methadone dose and then they go out and drink a fifth of vodka, then they're pretty much writing their own death sentence. Multiple previous treatments for drug abuse with frequent relapses. If this person doesn't appear to be ready to take it seriously, then the chances of them going out and doing something contraindicated are high. So if they have frequent relapses and they don't have long periods of sobriety and there's no way you can keep them in some sort of a controlled environment until you can be confident in their early recovery, they're poor treatment candidates. If they've had a poor response to previous attempts with buprenorphine or methadone, or if they have significant medical complications. Now a caveat here is methadone has been used in certain patients as an adjunct or to help them with pain management. Um, it helps also prevent abuse because it's not like the doctor writes a prescription for 100 Lortab or 100 Vicodin and sends you home. You have to come and dose every single day and be randomly urine dropped and all that other happy stuff. So it does prevent abuse and it allows the doctor to understand more about what's going on. Services. Group and individual counseling need to be strengths based. We've talked about this in other presentations. Start with what the client has. Don't try to reinvent the wheel and focus all, on all the things he or she is doing wrong and doesn't have and oh my goodness because that can be overwhelming. What does the client have? Social supports, a job, a house. Do they have somebody that's in their corner or do they only have the courage to show up and ask for help? If they're in your office and they're there voluntarily, they've got something, they've got hope. If you can't start anywhere else, start there. Strengths based. Use motivational approaches to help them move through the stages of change. Again, if they're presenting and they're voluntary, they're probably in the action stage. However, when you start poking around in group therapy or they get tired of driving to the clinic every day, they may go back to preparation. So think about different ways you can use motivational approaches and maybe contingency reinforcement in order to keep people involved in the program. Use cognitive behavioral approaches 
in group and individual to help them address some of their stinking thinking. Make sure to address substance abuse and mental health concurrently. Otherwise, you're going to end up with somebody who's sober and depressed, not a good combination for long-term sobriety, or you're going to end up with someone who is drinking, which will mess up the neurotransmitters and bring the depression back. So we need to address them both concurrently. How can you deal with life on life's terms? And yeah, life may have handed you a bunch of lemons. So let's figure out how we can deal with that so you're not depressed and anxious and just wanting to escape and make it all stop. It's important that we help clients and their support systems realize the interaction between substance abuse, mental health, and other issues such as legal, financial, housing, health, nutrition, exercise, and sleep. Those are my big ones. All of these things can increase anxiety, increase depression, um, make it easier or harder to get substances of abuse, but we need to be able to recognize the interaction and how they can all start creating a downward spiral or changes can, in one area, can create sort of an upward stepping motion. You can't spiral up, so I guess we walk up steps. Psychoeducation. What are the fundamentals of addiction? Why do people use? How do people develop cravings? What's the operant conditioning? All, all, all that stuff that we learned in Psychology 101. Communication skills. How can you honestly communicate with other people and yourself in a way that is meaningful, not hurtful, all that other stuff? Many, many addicts that I've worked with have anger issues. And those anger issues tend to come out in their communication skills, especially when they feel anxious, cornered, stressed. They tend to be a little snippy. Not all the time, some people withdraw. Neither extreme is helpful in recovery. They need to be able to communicate, first figure out and communicate with themselves what the heck's going on, but then communicate that to their supports. Coping skills. There's a variety of them out there. Most of our clients used some to deal with life before their coping skills got overwhelmed. So let's take what they were already using and build them up. Relapse prevention. What is relapse? Understanding that relapse happens long before you pick up again. It's the changes in behavior, it's the changes in thinking, it's the changes in attitude that eventually lead you back. Employment and interview skills. Interviewing is hard for anybody, well, most anybody. So helping people practice these skills so they're not stressed out and helping them find jobs that fit their temperament where they're not going to be miserable. We want them to find a career, not just a job, if possible. Relationship skills. Many addicts, not all, many addicts grew up in families where boundaries were on roller skates and there was codependency and enabling and all kinds of other stuff. They have no idea what a proper, healthy relationship looks like. So, this is a good time to start looking at relationship myths and how to develop mutually beneficial friendships and relationships with significant others. And then looking at stinking thinking. Cognitive distortions and irrational thoughts. Google them, you'll get lists that come up. It's the same ones um, over and over again. So you want to look at some of these things and have clients identify ways that they take molehills and make them into mountains. Or they put too much pressure on themselves. One of the things that I ask clients when we're talking about irrational thoughts, like I have to be perfect at everything all the time, I say, would you ask your child to do that? And they usually look at me and go, no. And I, well, why do you ask yourself to do that? Why are you only lovable if you're perfect at everything all the time, yet you'll love your child if they're imperfect? A lot of these 
distortions and irrational thoughts are things that sort of morphed over time as we grew out of dysfunctional environments. It's time now that the person has greater coping skills and they're adults and all that kind of stuff to look back at these beliefs and say keep that one, get rid of that one, that one, and that one. They can do that now. Medications. If you need medications for mental health, look at getting to a psychiatrist or another doctor who can prescribe those. Substance abuse. If you need methadone maintenance, which is what we're talking about here, or other medications such as antabuse for alcohol, if you're not aware. It's important to be aware of what's out there and make sure your clients are aware of what is out there and what can be used concurrently. Pain. That bottom level of the hierarchy. If someone is in chronic pain, they're not sleeping well, they're probably not eating well, and they're just generally miserable all the time. We need to help them deal with chronic pain. There are a lot of treatments such as acupressure, acupuncture, um, medication, of course, um, TENS units. There are massage, a variety of different things that people can use that are not opiate based. But they need to work with a pain management physician to figure out what that is. Pro-social activities to address downtime. Idle hands. Idle time is a time when people start getting bored, feeling bad, romanticizing the past, whatever they do. Not good in early recovery. What are you going to do to address downtime? Are you going to, maybe you just go to the library and read a book. Because you're most likely not going to be shooting up when you're sitting in the middle of the library. Provide support and acceptance from pro-social peers. Make sure people are establishing a peer group. Maybe they meet for coffee. Maybe it's their home group. Maybe it's at their church. Maybe it's the meeting, the NA meeting that they go to, or the AA meeting they go to if they go to AA as well. We need to help people learn how to have fun while they're sober. A lot of the clients that came through our facility, I guess I could say I modeled it, I have fun. I don't take myself too seriously. There is a time and a place to be serious. And there's a time and a place to skip down the halls and sing Goober Peace. And <laughs> you know, it just depended. And yeah, you've got to think hard about when that last one's appropriate. But I enjoyed laughing at myself because I would do silly things and it's okay. I enjoyed laughing at myself because I am totally uncoordinated and going out on the ropes course was just a joke and a half but that's okay I know what my strengths are and I'm okay laughing at myself a lot of people in their addiction remember that I have to be perfect at everything all the time in order to be lovable they're not used to taking risks they're afraid of being criticized or judged when people laugh they take it personally we need to have fun. Sometimes we would go to a park and there was a playground at the park and I would suggest to people just not to gawk because that's kind of weird but to observe children periodically and watch them because you know what they laugh at themselves. They slide down the slide and they fall on their butt and they give, giggle hysterically. It's like oh won't do that again or maybe they will who knows. People who've been in their addiction for a long time have forgotten how to have fun. They've forgotten how to play in the rain or jump in the puddles or watch little squirrels run up and down the trees. They forgot to appreciate the little things in addition to the big things. So it's important for us to help them realize that sobriety can be really fun because not only is it fun when you're doing it, but you can remember it afterwards too. Child care. They can't come to treatment if they don't have child care. Now they can come for dosing possibly, but coming to groups, they need child care. Vouchers, setting up child care at your facility, whatever is necessary. 
Transportation. People would drive 75 miles every day to get to the clinic for dosing. At $4 a gallon, that's really expensive. Um, so are there transportation options for people to get to the clinic and back out again? Some clinics, some methadone clinics have developed a mobile van that goes around to the rural areas and provides the dosing in that mobile van in order to keep clients from having to figure out how to get 75 miles to the clinic. Food. We need to help them nourish their bodies, help them get set up with social services if they need it, help them get set up with food pantries, help them understand what good nutrition is, because a lot of our clients, yeah, they don't know. Cheeseburger sounds pretty good. Medical and dental care. They need to be healthy, they need to be able to eat the food, and they need to not be afraid to smile. It's hard to make friends and do well in interviews and all that kind of stuff, if you're afraid to smile, or it hurts to smile. Possible side effects can be weakness and loss of energy, back pain, chills, hot flashes, sweating, flu-like symptoms, constipation, diarrhea, dry mouth, anxiety, depression, and in some limited numbers of people, euphoria. So, like most other medications that are out there, they have a laundry list of side effects. The long and the short of it is, let Jim Bob know that if he starts taking the methadone or the buprenorphine or the naloxone or whatever it is, and starts feeling bad, to call the clinic. Tell us what your symptoms are, and we'll help you figure out if that's to be expected, or if that's something that will go away, or what we call an unacceptable side effect, something that we probably have to monkey with the medication a little bit to help you not have that side effect. Let Jim Bob know what things are going to pass and how long it will take. Most people, if they know that it's going to take three or five days and then you'll feel better, they can push through. But if you say, well, you're going to detox for a while, uh, is that two days? Is that two weeks? What are we talking? How long am I going to feel this bad? Risks of drug interaction. During any agonist-based pharmacotherapy, abusing depressants such as alcohol, other opioid agonists, or benzos may be fatal. Current or potential cardiovascular risk factors may be aggravated by agonist pharmacotherapy. And it's important to remember that many other drugs interact with opioid agonist medications, over-the-counter and prescription. Make sure your clients know this includes herbs, over-the-counter medications, anything that they're taking, they need to clear or run by the attending physician. Patients should know the symptoms of arrhythmia, which include heart palpitations, dizziness, lightheadedness, syncope, which their heart feels out of rhythm, or seizures. If they feel any of these, they need to seek immediate medical attention. Maintaining and not exceeding dosage schedules, amounts, and other medication regimens are important to avoid adverse drug reactions. It's kind of like you wouldn't take a dose of decongestant at 8 o'clock in the morning and then and it's one of those six hour decongestants and decide oh this isn't doing all that I want it to do and take another dose at 9 o'clock because there's a significant chance of adverse interactions. We need to maintain the dosage schedules. These are medications. The consensus panel recommends the following goals for initial screening. Crisis intervention. We need to figure out if there are any crises going on. If there are, we need to fix them now before we start getting you on this very structured regimen. Eligibility verification. Once we start you on the meds, are you going to be able to pay for them? Clarification of the treatment alliance. 
You understand that when you start taking the medication, you also have to come to treatment. You can't just show up, get your dose, and leave indefinitely and not complete your mandatory counseling hours. Explanation of the patient and program responsibilities. Education about methadone maintenance or methadone treatment. Communication of essential information about methadone and OTP operations and discussions of the benefits and drawbacks of methadone therapy. And finally, identification of treatment barriers. Transportation, child care, work schedules. What things might prevent you from getting here to dose? Because we know that the withdrawal syndrome sets in pretty quickly, so if you don't get here to dose in the morning, um, it's going to be a problem. We need to make sure we can count on you to consistently be here. Do you have administrative options for providing dosing in the afternoon for those people who missed morning dosing or can't make the morning dosing? Behavioral and circumstantial indicators of suicide risk. Well, if they talk about committing suicide, it's a good indication. If they're having trouble eating or sleeping, if they have drastic changes in behavior, it's just not even the same person that came in last week. Withdrawal from friends or social activities. Loss of interest in hobbies, work, school, friendships. And preparations for death, such as making a will or final arrangements. Making plans for Fluffy to go to a new home. Giving away prized possessions. Making childcare arrangements for enduring periods. All of these indicate a relatively high level of suicide risk. A history of suicide attempts is also another indicator. If they have crossed that line before, they might not be as hesitant to cross it again. If they start taking unnecessary risks, so it's like, well, if my higher power wants me to survive, I will, otherwise, screw it. Not, not a good place to have clients be because if they're taking unnecessary risks and you know they're taking unnecessary risks, then you have a responsibility to provide some sort of an intervention. Recent severe losses, and that's what the person considers severe. You may not consider it severe, but if it's devastating to them, then it could have a significant impact on their mood. Remember, people who are suicidal feel helpless and hopeless. If something has happened to make this person feel helpless and hopeless, maybe they were foreclosed on, or their spouse left them, or their dog died, or their chi all their children moved away and now they've got an empty nest, whatever it is that is severely impacting them is very personal. A preoccupation with death and dying, loss of interest in personal appearance, and an increased use of alcohol or drugs. These are all indicators of a higher level of suicide. Expressed emotions that may indicate suicide risk. I can't stop the pain. I just can't think clearly anymore. I can't make decisions. I can't see solutions. Can't sleep, eat, or work. Can't get out of the depression. You notice the common word? Can't. Cannot. I am helpless to change this and I feel hopeless if it doesn't change. I can't make the sadness go away. I can't see a future without pain. I just don't see myself as worthwhile. Like I can't imagine a time where I would be useful to anyone. All of these, and this is not an exhaustive list, but it gives you an idea of the things that someone might say that indicate that they feel helpless and hopeless and the pain, whether physical or emotional, has to stop. Be direct. Talk openly and matter-of-factly about suicide. Saying, do you feel like you're going to commit suicide? Or do you feel like killing yourself? That's not putting the idea into their head. If they were feeling that, 
then it's okay to talk about it now that you brought it up and you've broached the subject. If they weren't feeling that, they'll look at you and go, no, that's okay too. But you're not going to plant a suggestion in their mind and they go, oh yeah, killing myself might be an option. It doesn't work that way. Be willing to listen. And don't debate with them whether suicide is right or wrong. Understand that they need the pain to stop. Get involved, become available, and please don't dare them to do it. I, I don't know why that was even part of the best practice, but evidently somebody must have done it at one point or another. Don't dare an individual to commit suicide. It's just not good. Don't act shocked. If somebody comes into your office, even if they haven't really been displaying signs, and says, you know, I can't take this anymore. I'm thinking about killing myself. Don't go, oh my gosh, let me call my supervisor. No. Okay. Let's talk about it. Let me hear what's going on. If the person has presented to you and is telling you they're suicidal, then they still have some ambivalence. There's still some hope that somewhere, someone can help them get out of this pit of despair. So don't act shocked, don't make them feel weird, don't be sworn to secrecy. Remind them that you have certain caveats in the confidentiality rules where you have to break confidentiality if there is an imminent danger. Take action, remove means such as guns or stockpiled pills. If they are in your facility and you think it's appropriate, you may need to get them committed to a crisis stabilization unit. Get help from persons or agencies specializing in crisis intervention and suicide prevention. If the person, if you talk with the person for a while and you end up consulting with your supervisor and deciding that this person is not in imminent danger and you're going to let them go home, have them sign a no harm contract Make sure they have someone who comes and picks them up who is going to be there and be available for them. Make sure you have follow-up plans. They're willing to talk to you or call in every four hours. Make sure there are plans in place. Make sure they know what they can do if things should start to get worse so they don't feel like, oh, I'm home and, ooh, I made a mistake. Maybe I should have stayed. Okay? How do you get back to the clinic? Make sure there's a plan in place. Recommended procedures for identifying and addressing domestic violence. Look for physical injuries. Pay attention to other indicators like a history of relapse or treatment noncompliance. Maybe the spouse will not let them come to treatment after there's been a particularly violent altercation because he or she does not want counselors, doctors, nurses, seeing the bruises. Maybe the person relapses a lot because every time they get beat up, they use to make the pain go away. Maybe they're forced to take the drugs because the abuser does not want them to get better. If they get better, then they're not going to be as controllable. If they have inconsistent explanations for injuries and evasiveness, it's important to remember that domestic violence is not exclusively physical and even physically violent relationships don't always leave marks. So just because you don't see injuries does not mean that there's not domestic violence. There are a lot of negatives in that. But watch for other signs and symptoms. Complications in pregnancy and stress and anxiety related illnesses and conditions. Now somebody may have always been anxious or had stress related conditions and it may not be a domestically violent relationship. Maybe there's a lot of stuff going on in their life and they hate their job and they're just one of those people who's very very anxious. That's possible. These are just indicators to look for so you can open the door and say if there's something going on I'm here to talk, I'm here to listen, I have resources that I can provide. 
and it's important to fulfill legal obligations to report suspected of abuse. In most states, if you in good conscience suspect that there's abuse, it's not, well, you know, that something might be going on. If you really, in your head, heart, and gut, believe that there's abuse going on, most states require you to at least make a phone call. All right. Once you have identified that there is domestic violence, get the patient's permission before discussing their case. Don't have them sitting in your office and call up the domestic violence shelter and go, I've got Sally James here and she's in a violent relationship and I was trying to convince her to come into shelter. No. No, 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 no. They are still your patient and confidentiality is still present. Um, it's important to understand what types of subpoenas and warrants require records to be turned over to authorities. So if Sally has disclosed that there's domestic violence, um, and maybe in the past or hasn't wanted to report it, it hasn't been to the level of needing to report it, whatever the reasons, but all of a sudden somebody shows up at your door with a subpoena, um, okay, we got a problem. You need to know what types of subpoenas require your records to be turned over. It's important to convey to clients that there is no justification for battering. There is no justification for emotional abuse, financial abuse, physical abuse. It's important to let them know, again, that just because there aren't bruises on the outside doesn't mean there aren't bruises on the inside. Contact domestic violence experts when battery is confirmed. There are people who go through hundreds of hours of training to work with this specific issue. Consult. Don't always take the burden of everything on yourself. You can consult without revealing the client's identity. You can call the domestic violence shelter and go, I've got a client who's going through X, Y, and Z. What should be my next step? Or what can I do to help her do whatever? Psychosocial problems that decrease your patient's success and or retention. Lack of stable housing. If they're homeless or they're bouncing around from couch to couch, the chances of them making treatment all the time are going to be pretty slim. Non-existent or dysfunctional family relationships. Family is however your clients define it. It can be blood relatives. It can be all the neighbors that lived in the neighborhood where they grew up. Whoever they call their family, whoever constitutes their support system, if there isn't one or it's dysfunctional, we're going to have a problem. Doesn't mean it's insurmountable, but that tells me that we've got a lot of work to do to help you develop a sober social support system. Poor social skills and a lack of a supportive social network. The going gets tough. Unless you're a 24-7, 365 residential program, they're going to, your clients are going to have to deal with life on life's terms and your program is not always going to be open. They need to have other resources. Not only because your program may be closed, but you don't want to establish dependency on you. You don't want them to come to you every time they need to make a decision. They need to be able to reach out to supports in the community. And unemployment or lack of employable s skills. We spend a lot of time at work. If you're not at work, you got to find something to do with your time. So if you don't have employment, you've got to find volunteer work or something else to do so you're not sitting at home watching Jerry Springer and eating bonbons. I don't even know if Jerry Springer's still on. But you get the point. There are triggers all around us and boredom is a huge trigger for many people. If people lack employable skills or don't have a job they may not have insurance which may keep them from affording medication as well. These are all things that can decrease patient success and retention. When you work with elderly patients monitor the increased risk for drug interactions. As people get older 
their body gets rid of the toxins more slowly. They, certain levels of medications can build up in their system, whereas a 20-year-old, it just flushes right out, it may stick in the liver of a 65-year-old. Geriatric physicians are specialized because they realize that elderly people have different reactions and interactions with drugs. It's important to differentiate between, between co-occurring disorders and symptoms and disorders associated with aging. Some things just happen as we get older. Um, some things may be symptoms of schizophrenia or psychosis. It's important to differentiate because they're going to be treated differently. Differentiate between depression and dementia. Screen for abuse. Elders are at a high risk of abuse. Devel develop referral sources specifically for your elderly patients. Most towns and communities have activities and places where um, the Area Agency for Aging, I believe is what it's called, has developed places that elders can go to share a meal, to play games, to do whatever. My grandmother goes to bingo three times a week, has for the past, well, ever since I can remember, so a couple decades. Uh, that's where she finds her interaction with people who get it. They grew up through the depression. They grew up through the same things. They're going through the same losses and experiences now that she is. Provide treatment for age-associated stressors, such as loss of the same amount of physical functioning or um, loss of your friends. As people get older, they start seeing their friends pass on, and that's difficult for them to tolerate sometimes. Assess and adjust dosage levels for medication, for, um, adjusting for the slowed metabolism of many elderly patients. Well, here's a little fun fact. For every pound of muscle you gain, you burn about 50 extra calories per day. So I figure five pounds equals one of the little packs of M&Ms. I digress. As we get older, especially if we don't continue to exercise, we lose muscle mass and we lose bone density. As we lose muscle mass, our metabolism starts to slow. And there are other things, but I'm trying to simplify this. So if you have elderly patients who have a slowed metabolism, they've lost a lot of their muscle mass, then they're not going to be burning calories or getting rid of toxins or doing anything internally as quickly as a 20-year-old. Six patient-centered phases for methadone treatment services. Acute, this is the detox off the illegal stuff, stabilization on the medication regime. regime. Rehabilitative, supportive care, medical maintenance, tapering, and continuing care. Some clinics stop at medical maintenance. The ones that I've been involved in at a certain point start tapering the person off and put them in continuing care just as you would anyone detox or in recovery from any other substance. During the acute phase, we're going to eliminate the illicit opioids prescribe a medication dosage that minimizes sedation and negative side effects assess the safety and adequacy of each dose after administration and rapidly but safely increase dosage to suppress withdrawal symptoms and cravings and discourage patients from self-medicating and discourage patients from self-medicating you know your clients if they think they can get away with self-medicating and taking the edge off, they will. Provide or refer clients for services to lessen the intensity of other biopsychosocial issues. Bio, medical, psycho, mental health, social, support, finances, legal, all that other access for stuff. Make referrals. You may be the single point of contact for the treatment team, but you're not expected to do everything. 
help patients identify high-risk situations and develop alternative strategies for coping. During the acute phase, you want to eliminate symptoms of withdrawal and craving. We want to help them express feelings of comfort and wellness throughout the day. We want them to start feeling good. We need to help them abstain from illicit opioids and abuse of opioids normally obtained by prescription by using drug tests. If they're on methadone maintenance and they don't tell this other doctor over here and they get a prescription for Vicodin, it's going to show up in a urine test. You need to mo monitor their levels. Engagement with treatment staff in assessment of medical, mental health, and psychosocial issues. And satisfaction of basic needs for food, shelter, and safety. Transition from acute to rehabilitative phase occurs when we see the withdrawal symptoms going away. There's decreased drug craving, elimination of illicit opioid use, and reduction in other substance use. Eh, many clinics say no other substance use. That's a policy thing. Completion of your assessment, development of the treatment plan, and satisfaction of those basic needs. In order to get into medical maintenance, you need to be in treatment for two years continuously and abstain from illicit drugs, not have an alcohol use problem, have safe, stable living conditions. Additionally, you have to be involved in productive activities, not sitting at home all day. No criminal or legal involvement for at least three years, and no current parole or probation status. It may be different in your state. In Florida, this is one of those things that was um, true. And it's also true as a best practice. If they're involved in the criminal justice system, if there's a risk of them going back to jail, if they're interacting with people who still have that criminogenic mentality, it's a risk factor. They need to have adequate social supports, an absence of significant unstabilized co-occurring disorders. We expect co-occurring disorders to be there. However, they need to be stabilized before somebody moves into medical maintenance. OTP required services, an assessment, a biopsychosocial assessment, an initial and annual medical assessment thereafter. Medication dispensing. Methadone has to be dispensed and gradually people earn the ability to get take-home doses so they don't have to come seven days a week. Drug testing. And identification and treatment or treatment referral for co-occurring disorders. Treatment planning. Case management. Now Again, I've said try to refer out. You may be the single point of contact. You may end up being the case manager because there's no funding to have a secondary case manager. However, somebody's got to provide the case management and follow up. And follow up. You don't just make a referral and go, okay, well, good luck. Next week when Jim Bob comes back, you need to say, did you contact Sally so-and-so at this agency? If not, why not? If so, how'd it go? Co-occurring disorders counseling. Co-occurring disorders are the expectation, not the exception. So we need to treat all patients when they come in as if they've got a co-occurring disorder. Because you know what? At some point, they're going to be depressed. Whether it qualifies as major depressive disorder or not, Understanding how depression interacts with relapse prevention and recovery is important. Address family problems as you're able. Provide HIV and hepatitis C testing, education, counseling, and referral. And make referrals, as in case management, for additional services as needed. 
Improve patient retention by individualizing medication dosages. Different people will have different needs, different tolerances. Clarify program goals and treatment plans and develop them with the client. This gets them to buy in and feel engaged in the process and understand what's going on. Make the entry process as simple as possible. In early recovery, people are usually still in a fog, so if it's really confusing, you're probably not going to keep them coming back. If it's really stressful, or they've got to wait in line for an hour and a half to get dosed, probably not going to come back. Attend to patients' financial needs. Help them get hooked up with social services as you can. Help them figure out if there is a way that insurance will pay for this. Help them try to address any of these needs. Reduce the attendance burden as much as possible. Instead of having them come to dose every single day at 5.30 in the morning and then they have to come back at 3 in the afternoon for group, which if you do the math doesn't really even allow enough time for most people to work an eight hour day, that's, not, that's going to work against you and it's going to work against the client in getting and maintaining employment. So reduce the attendance burden by making groups available first thing in the morning. By making groups available interactive through a secure online connection. Providing options for people so they don't have to come to the clinic every single day once they've phased up and they start having take-home doses. Provide useful treatment services as soon as possible. If the person's in a real fog and detoxing and not feeling well, they're not going to get much. We need to stabilize. But as soon as they're able to start taking in information, start giving it a little bit at a time. Don't overwhelm people. You give them a book that's this thick, they're probably never going to open it. You give them two pages at a time, they'll get through the same book, but they won't be overwhelmed and they'll actually get the information. Enhance staff-patient interactions. This whole therapeutic alliance thing is crucial. It's crucial. If patients don't feel like they can speak up, or if staff is always in a bad mood and rushed with paperwork and everything else, clients aren't going to feel cared about and they're going to drop out. Improve staff knowledge and attitudes about methadone therapy. Many substance abuse treatment programs are adamantly opposed to methadone maintenance or methadone treatment. If you are willing to consider it as a harm reduction or as an interim or however you want to look at it, you will need to educate the staff in traditional substance abuse treatment facilities. Many of them are in recovery and have very very strong opinions. Counseling in methadone therapy provides support, monitor other problematic behaviors, anger outbursts, abusing other substances, lying, breaking the law, help them comply with rules, identify problems that need case management, help them try to figure out how to remove barriers to full treatment participation, and provide motivational enhancement for positive lifestyle changes. Motivational enhancement we talk a lot about. You can learn more about it in tip 35. But basically we, we want to keep people engaged. We want them to walk out of our clinic every single day going, I got something out of that. Standard components of substance abuse counseling. Help them get involved in a mutual help or peer support program. Educate them about addiction and the effects of different substances and the interactions. Educate about relapse prevention strategies. Identify unexpected problems needing attention. Maybe suddenly there's a death in the family or six months into it, Sally reveals that she's been hearing voices for the past 15 years. There are a lot of things that come up that are not necessarily expected 
and it's important for us to be aware and be ready for changes constantly because we're dealing with people we're dealing with life and life is not predictable and assist patients in complying with program rules and regulations inform patients about stress and time management techniques assist them in developing a healthy lifestyle hungry angry lonely and tired halt if you can start there you will be well on your way to helping them develop a, a lifestyle that helps prevent relapse assist them in joining socially constructive groups volunteer groups church groups recreational groups that are positive such as hiking clubs or birding clubs or pottery or scrapbooking or okay those are mine um, I'm sure your clients can find things to do have them look on I think it's meetup.com or type in their hobby and meetup photography meetup and different meetup groups that are close to you will come up provide continuing education on health issues make sure that they're aware of things that happen and changes in medication and anything that may be pertinent to them in individual counseling you want to review how the patient feels physically and emotionally how are they coping with cravings and what's the progress on changing their lifestyle to be clean and sober review their drug tests with them and what they mean identify any emergencies or crises that may need to be dealt with right now review their treatment plan and where they are they should constantly just like you look at a map when you're driving from Montana to Kansas you need to be able to review the treatment plan periodically and make sure that you're accomplishing those objectives in a timely fashion and you're still on the right track if you need to detour write it in the treatment plan if you took a detour you didn't mean to get back on track identify measurable goals and reasonable time frames Rome wasn't built in a day people are not going to work the 12 steps in 12 weeks well many do but they don't work them well review progress in achieving goals including abstinence and complement it highlight all the things that they're doing well highlight their strengths help them see that they're doing a lot of the right things and if there's anything that needs adjustment try to work that into being a learning moment using their strengths instead of well you're doing all these things really well I don't know why you keep screwing up here yeah. discuss dosage and take-home medications any legal concerns family concerns that they may have and address any routine issues that may be presenting barriers for treatment compliance strategy for contingency management pick a target behavior that can be measured easily such as showing up for dosing on time staying clean provide non-monetary incentives for accomplishing the desired behavior such as non-refundable movie passes um, whatever you can get a lot of times you can get them donated but if you can't if you have a fund that you can use for contingency management you don't want them to be too big if they're of too much street value they can be sold and that's a whole other problem but they also need to be something the client wants I don't go to movies I cannot sit still for two hours or however long it is in a movie theater I would much rather watch a video on TV that I can pause and get up I love the DVR you need to know what's meaningful for your client specify the link between the targeted behavior and the reward if you make it in for dosing on time for the next month then you will be able to earn whatever one of the programs I worked with people would earn points and at the end of every month they would tally the points 
and then there was a closet that we had all of these different rewards in. And if you had five points, you could select things from this shelf. If you had 15 points, you could select things from this shelf. If you chose to save your points, then you could add them later. But if you lost points during the month, um, depending on how many you lost, you may not be able to select any rewards. So it's a token economy for grown-ups, basically. It can be effective. It's also a way of engaging people in the process if it's something that they really want. Put contracts in writing, specify their durations, and changes over time in contingencies. Devote part of each session to addressing patients' most recent successes and failures regarding their substance use. Focus on their successes and then when you have to talk about the failures say alright but you relapsed here. When, What was different when you relapsed between when you were staying clean and how can we make this clean time carry on? Let's look at the differences because clearly you were able to stay clean for a while so you've got skills and tools what was the hiccup? That sounds a whole lot better than you stayed clean all this time, then you went and screwed it up by using. That's what the client's thinking. We don't want to re reinforce that fatalistic negative behavior of why should I even try because I'm going to end up messing it up in the end. Adopt an active therapist role. Strengthen their resolve to stop substance use. Help them see all the positive changes that are occurring as they start feeling better. And teach them to recognize relapse war warning signs and develop coping skills. Assist them in rearranging priorities in order to re reduce preoccupation with substance use. If they use because they get stressed, if they use because they hate their job, if whatever reasons that keep them preoccupied with substance use. Assist them in re rearranging their priorities to be recovery centric. Meetings are a priority. Sleep is a priority. Stress management is a priority. Maybe I'm not picking up my dry cleaning today. That's not a priority. Help them identify the controllable stressors and anything that they may be able to put off if they're feeling overly burdened. Help them manage painful effects of what's going on, physical or emotional. Help them enhance their social functioning and supports. And start opening that Pandora's box, addressing their stuff, going to the closet, what, however you want to call it only after you've developed a strong therapeutic alliance and you know that they've got social supports out there. Because what you talk about in session, while you may be able to walk out of the therapy room and just kind of compartmentalize it all and okay, you know, take a few breaths and I'm on to my two o'clock, they have this open gaping wound and you may have put a band-aid on it, but if it starts to reassert itself, three hours later they need to have somebody they can call. They need to have strategies for dealing with that besides returning to substance use. Psychoeducation serves as an orientation to both the treatment program and recovery processes. If you can involve family members and friends, wonderful! Try to make it as unobtrusive as possible. If you can have informational videos on your website, I come back to that a lot, most people have either an iPhone or a computer or can go to the library and watch a short educational video. Short, 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, people start getting bored. Adapt educational strategies and materials to meet the patient's cultural, educational, and family needs. Discuss methadone and other medications and dispel any myths that may come up. Discuss the implications of continuing substance use 
while in a methadone treatment program. Discuss sexual behaviors that may affect relapse. Discuss the power of triggers with patients and their families. Help families understand what triggers are. Most families, most sober social supports who've never had an addiction have a real difficult time wrapping their head around the strength of the compulsion to use. Incorporate special groups to discuss parenting, child care, women's issues, and coping with any medical issues associated with use. Common topics in patient education. The physical and psychological effects of opioid and other substance abuse. Health ed. The effect of drug use on family and other relationships. And in this part, I really like to include the members of the addicted family. The scapegoat, the hero, the enabler. You've all heard those before. It's sometimes fun, if you can get the group to do it, to act out those different roles and see how we've embodied them and how we continue to create the same family dynamics in our future lives. We may not even be in our family of origin anymore, but we've created a family with all those same characteristics. We've created another addicted family, so how do we address each one of those issues? Introduction to mutual help groups such as NA, AA, Al-Anon, and dual disorders recovery. Talk about the effects and side effects of addiction treatment medications and interactions with other drugs. Discuss symptoms of co-occurring disorders. Help clients and their families understand the symptoms or the early warning signs that a depressive episode is coming on, of a panic attack, of an anxiety attack, so they can call them what they are and then deal with them instead of feeling like I'm going to crawl out of my skin and I have no idea why or what to do. Help them identify the addictive qualities of compulsive behaviors besides substance abuse, gambling, sex, food, shopping. Those are the big ones that come to mind. Patient goals in building relapse prevention skills. They need to understand that relapse is a process, not an event. You didn't relapse on Saturday. You used on Saturday. You probably relapsed three months ago or three weeks ago, depending on how strong your plan was. Relapse is a process that usually starts with getting overwhelmed, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, worn down, any of those things, then you start having attitude changes and it starts getting overwhelming. Develop new coping skills for high risk situations. Make lifestyle changes to decrease the need for drugs. Increase participation in healthy activities such as exercise or taking your dog on a walk, taking your dog to the dog park. Then you don't even have to exercise. Just let Fido run around. But you're probably not going to use at the dog park. And guess what? There's a lot of people around there that you can chat with. Understand and address social pressures to use substances. Develop a sort supportive relapse prevention network and methods of coping with negative emotional states. Do you journal? Do you take a hot bath? Do you go on a long run? Do you pray? Do you sing? Do you start undertaking some sort of a household improvement project? What do you do? And I don't just mean the demolition part of the home improvement project. Although that is a fun part. Help them learn methods of coping with cognitive distortions. Identifying their own relapse warning signs and triggers. They're different. Everybody's different. So I can't just give you a book of 15 warning signs and go, this works for everybody. Help them combat memories of drug abuse associated euphoria. Romanticizing the past and don't let them talk about it in group because that starts triggering everybody. Reinforce recollections of negative aspects of drug use. Why is it that you wanted to get sober again? 
Yeah, okay. Avoid people, places, and things that might trigger drug use and help them develop pleasurable and rewarding alternatives to drug use. Pleasurable and rewarding. If it's not something that makes them happy, that produces at least a little euphoria, they're probably not going to engage it in it. They're going to be at a higher risk for relapse. It needs to solve the serve the same function as the drugs, although it may not to the same degree. It needs to help stop the pain or help them feel pleasant. First responses to a behavioral problem, identify it. Review the treatment plan. Discuss the plan with the patient and modify or intensify treatment to match the patient's treatment status. If they're having difficulty staying clean and, clean and sober, complying with treatment, coming as when they're supposed to, whatever the behavioral problem, nip it in the bud. Remedial approaches include reevaluating medication dosages, adjust dosages for adequacy and patient comfort, assess co occurring disorders, and provide psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy as needed, intensify counseling, add ancillary services, treat medical or other associated problems, and consider alternative medications. So basically, if the treatment plan's not working, you need to step up the intensity. Bio, psycho, social, maybe all of them, maybe consider residential. Provide inpatient detoxification from substances of abuse and continue opioid pharmacotherapy. Change counselors if indicated. If you're just not jiving, you may need to change counselors. If it is a resistance issue, the counselor may need to seek consultation. When the going gets tough, we don't automatically kick them to the curb. You need to try to work with them and work through it. But you also need to recognize when keeping that relationship going is doing more harm than good. And provide family intervention when possible. Physical interventions to managing chronic non-malignant pain. Cold compresses, hot compresses, ultrasound, TENS units, massage, stretching, orthotics, splints, braces, positioning aids. There's a whole lot of things. Have the patient work with a pain management physician. Psychological interventions to managing chronic pain may include deep relaxation, biofeedback, guided imagery, cognitive behavioral, PTSD treatment, or hypnosis. In summary, methadone treatment uses a phased approach. Patients are provided integrated, holistic treatment, and methadone therapy provides a viable means for many people to end their addiction to opiate-based illicit drugs. I've included slides that have common drug combinations and effects. These are some drug descriptions you should know just so you have the basics. A lot of my counselors that did not work in the, in the methadone clinic but worked over in the residential substance abuse treatment side, I had them keep this as a printout in their desk. So if people started asking them questions or if they got a client from the methadone clinic, they could easily reference what was being prescribed and then converse with the clinic as needed.